Okay, so I forgot, I didn't bring Mu Yu today, but um, we'll just go straight into meditation. Uh, we'll do 10 times Amitofo and probably I'll guide a little bit along the way. Nothing big, I'm just think of deep breath, think of that. So let's do 10 times Amitofo first. Amitofo. Amitofo. A mi to fo 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 Use the sound of the chanting to anchor your thoughts. Do not focus on the conversation itself, rather the sound. The silence between the sound. of how you react to the sound. Relax your legs. Relax your shoulders. If it cramps up, loosen it, let go, follow Amitofo.
relax your jaws. Let it fall naturally. your breath good or bad you still need to breathe loud or quiet you still need to breathe so breathe Remember, we don't get these chances to be in peace, in quiet, often. Remember what Buddha did, searching a path out of his existence. Remember how he sat under the trees. His determination, his drive to break free from six realms. What keep us in six realms? At this very moment, let it be. Your responsibility, your worries, your desires, your wants, let it be. Just like the passing of the sound, or your breath, or that horn that you just hear, it will go as quickly as it comes. All that's left is your breath and that chanting sound. Leave all that outside the door, you will have to pick it up again later. But for now, leave it out there.
back in Buddha's time, the bhiksu and bhiksunis usually practice in a place where they can, cannot even hear the cows mooing. It has to be a really removed places. Chinese is called Anan Luo. It's a Sanskrit word of a place where you cannot hear anyone yelling. Now imagine the opposite, which is what we are in now. You can hear the sounds, the horns, the cars. Imagine the difficulties we have to dealt with. Yet we are here. Yet we are here. between the movements, in between the works, family commitments, friends, ourselves, we persist. We still want to chant Amitofo. That's not easy. So have faith in yourself. Now we use compassion. Think of what are they talking about, arguing about. To feed us, to provide for the temple. They worry so we don't have to worry. They toy so we don't have to toy. Have a peace of mind over here. So be grateful, be thankful to them. With that, no matter how many noises made, you will be more grateful rather than the opposite. Thank you everyone, Amito for. Okay, how was it? Peaceful. <laughs> Peaceful. Peaceful amidst the wind. Yeah. We have 94, where it's more removed from everything else. But think of our life. How often do we have a chance to get that removed? And how often do we have to go in this? Things happening behind the scenes. You have to deal with your task at hand. You know, at one hand, your family, your friends, maybe your lovers. The other hand, your commitments, your work, your responsibilities, your duties. You know, those are those are what facing us. I think mostly. Have a piece of your mind is very important, but have a piece of your mind in the middle of all this chaos is even more important. And that's exactly what we're trying to aim for in, um, in the teachings. Um, that's why Master Ching Kong is setting his headquarters in Hong Kong, not in a beautiful, peaceful place in Toowoomba. High view, I went there, I cleaned the hedges. It's quiet. You can't hear a cow moo. Literally, Anan Luo, a standard for a practitioner to be going there. But he chose to be in Hong Kong. You know why? Hong Kong has a lot of people. And with that, 
it connects to the rest of the world. And he could have just chose high, high few and continue his teaching there, but no, he chose Hong Kong. There's too many people, many problems, many help needed, and has, hence that's why he's there. Yeah. And look at Taiwan as well, Tainan, they built that in the city center where everyone can reach it easily. So yeah, that's the heart of, um, I would say, our Mahayana path. Of course, find yourself a piece of time, land, or places and time where you can be alone, but which we will learn later from Venerable Mahakasyapa. He, he go totodi, he's an ascetic. He's number one foremost in ascetism. That means he um, remove himself from the crowd, get himself, you know, away from the noises and lead a very disciplinary life. You know, think of, um, think of a diet of, you know, one meal a day uh, and very strict uh, routine, you know, stricter than professional athletes or something like that. So, so let's get into it. What time is it? 10. All right. So we have um, 10. That's not 10, that's 11. Yeah. Um, we'll begin with the venerable... Um, let's, let's start by chanting the name of the founder, right? Shyamin Buddha. Hi. Just in time. Please take a seat. Um, so we'll begin by chanting the name... <laughs> Cramp. <laughs> All right, guys, let's relax our leg for now. Stretch your leg because I can see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm still not flexible enough. Do you introduce ourselves? Oh, we've been. Oh, Jenny, maybe? Yeah. So, yeah. I'm 18. Oh, I just finished the GCSE, so I'm in the university. Congratulations. <laughs> Sorry, what you need again? Um, I'm in clinical psychology at UNSW. UNSW. Yeah. Do you know we have a practicing psychologist here? Oh, really? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect timing. Yeah. So let's introduce ourselves as well. I'm yeah. Jennifer. I'm Dylan, I'm 29, OMG, uh, and I'm a practicing, not really, I'm just an associate in the bank, in the bank, yeah. Nice to meet What do you do? I work in a hospital. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. That's good. I'm Kenny, I'm studying at Macquarie University for exercise and sports science course. Um, 20 years old. Hi. All right, guys. Thank you. Yep, uh, venerable, actually, why not? Let me bring something up. Sorry guys, I'm a, I'm a move, move around kind of people. Uh, sitting still is a very challenging task for me. <laughs> Yet, we're here. <laughs> um, I have notes because uh, there's a lot of things to offer on story of Mahakashyapa. We might not even have time for venerable Suputi because venerable Mahakashyapa Number one, what do we know about Venerable Mahakashyapa? In Chinese, Da Jia Se. Yeah. He's a what? The flower servant. Flower servant. I think he only take offerings from. Sorry, we're we'll finished with, yeah. The one that the flower. Hmm. The Zen, the OG, the origin of Zen Buddhism. Yeah. I think he only took offerings from the poor, is it? 
also Paul Hickok. Yep, that's right. Another important point about him. He doesn't take offerings from the rich. Rich people. Yeah. yeah. It has something to do with Sukuti as well. Anyone else? You look like you're going to have to say something. Well, just here one's name on the bottom. Yep. It's a big name. It's actually a huge name. Um, Venerable, uh, before that, I forgot again. Let's chant the name of the founder. Sorry. Uh, Namo Shaya Muni Buddha. Namo Shaya Muni Buddha. Namo Shaya Muni Buddha. Namo Shaya Muni Buddha. A meter four. So, Buddha has 10 great disciples. Last week we have touched uh, two top disciples, the, um, the, f the foremost one, which is Shariputra, Shali Zi, and Shali Fu, and uh, Mogadalayana. Pronunciation. Mogadalayana. Uh, Shariputra was known for his wisdom. He's the chief disciple, basically manager of the Sangha. So he's, he's the one that helps Buddha to manage the Sangha while he's away, while, because it's 2,500 people all the time. There's going to be someone to take care of the day-to-days and, and, and all that. And then there is uh, Mogadalayana, who is very, very, very skilled in uh, performing miracles, uh, so to speak, the you know supernatural abilities. Um, and... He was praised, even though Buddha prohibits, not, he discouraged using this kind of miracles to teach the sentient beings because he know when to use it, when not to use it. He know the limits. Uh, so, yeah, he was praised for that. And anyone else, because quite a bit of us not there last week, um, anyone else know anything about Shariputra? Wisdom. He is known for wisdom. Yep. Anything else? Okay, Sariputra uh, has a very, um, how to say, interesting story about how hard, it, how, how hard it is to cultivate a body heart, you know, heart to save sentient beings. Have you guys heard of a story where the eye was, a monk offering the left eye to a young person, and the young person say, Oh, I'm sorry, my mom actually needs to, your uh, uh, right eye of a virtuous monk to save her illness. And so this monk takes out his right eye. A a again, he's trying to help the sentient beings. And this monk has attained enlightenment. Um, so he does not have any strong attachment to the bodies. Uh, however, when he did that, the young man did not accept it gracefully. He stomped both eyeballs on the floor, squashed it. So it's literally slap in the face, except with your eyeballs. Gone. So, so is he blind forever? Or like he used superpower to re re reclaim the eyes? Stay tuned for next episode. See you. <laughs> 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 so now, um, actually, because he has supernatural power, he can just restore it. Um, but the point is the attitude, right? It's just in, in your face, right? Like, oh, can I, some lesser skill, if someone asks for your help, can you help me you know, donate? 10k to me, I need to help my um, family, you know, with a fa medical fund. They just take the money and go casino or something. Mm -hmm. Squander it in your face. So it's like, it's disgusting, the eyeballs. What is this? Throw it on the floor and squash it. So he's like, of course, as an enlightened person, he does not have hatred. Like Renable Wooding said, no hatred, no need for vengeance or anything. He's, he's seen through that, but he's still not in the level of Bodhisattva yet, where he you know, despite this, I was to save you. So he's like, well, it's pretty hard to deal with this kind of sentient being. So I'm just going to go back to my, you know, nice little spot, my quiet little spot and just continue my own cultivation because he can continue his path anyway, regardless. And that's when this young man turned into a heavenly being and say, oh, um, dear Venerable, uh, it's actually Shariputra. Dear Venerable Shariputra, please do not be uh, swayed by this situation. It's just meant to show you how hard it is to, um, to save sentient beings. People will spit in your face even though you give them an olive branch. And the world, matters, the world will say, do not give them another 
branch, right? But as a practitioner of a path of enlightenment, we need to understand why a person behaves like this instead of just react and be a speed and, and let it be because you're not going to solve the problem fundamentally. And not everyone has that time or effort to do that, but at least understand, you know. So this um, heavenly beings, you know, this Deva is just being kind, trying to test him basically. He won't do that to us, of course, because the first moment you say, can I take your eyeballs with that? You'd be like, what are you doing? Send him to the mental hospital. <laughs> so it's not going to work on that. All right. So, yeah. yeah. That reminds me of our daily life. If there is someone that we encounter, mm. and then we feel like that person, why we are treated like that by that man, or yeah. um, actually that person could eventually turn into a heavenly being. That <laughs> <laughs> or in a dream, so, right? Like, so, yeah. so, so in a way, it's like we should appreciate that the lessons the other person given to us, yeah. and just learn something from it. Mm -hmm. um, so this is for our own development, you know? I think it's, it, it's a good lesson. The only time where we... That is right. The only time when we no longer get sway yes. is when we become Buddha. Yeah. Like other other times, even your Bodhisattva or anything, you still have this encourage test, you know, because we, we need to improve ourselves. And the only way you can improve yourself, of course, without getting crushed, is get that level where you can manage it, but not really. You feel like, what is this? So for venerable Shariputra, is digging both of his eyeballs out that he can restore of course, and see the attitude, see the face, this kind of bad attitude and how can he still maintain that compassionate mindset? Like this guy must have a lot of issues or I, um, I already made my vow to help them regardless of their attitude. All right. Maybe the right way to help me differs. There are many methods you can employ to your, um, with the wisdom to help that person, you know, can be, good cop, bad cop, so to speak. Um, but the intention is that not becoming hatred or vengeance. That's very important. You know, turning it into hatred and vengeance this is precisely the falling point of many great cultivators in histories. Um, right? Like one of the sons of the king in Chinese, I think is Asa Si Wang, something like that. That's the one who Mother, mother is and father was being, um, sorry, I, I'm not good at the name, but uh, the mom and dad is the king and the queen. They were locked by their son, who, in the past life, they are all practitioners. So the son was a practitioner in past life, but um, I think he was killed by his father. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right, being killed by his father in the past yes, life. Yes, you want to say. You want to die in mm. two more years' time or three more years' time. Yeah. But he said, I, I, I need to, the king can have wait for that long, so he killed him. Something like that. So the story goes like that, where he was practicing past life and he got killed by his then, you know, past life of his father. And so he vowed to vengeance instead of Buddha, who vowed to save him first time when he gained enlightenment. So that little differences is a very minute difference, guys. He has practiced a lot. But that little differences make him into a rebellious son and trap his father. Eventually, actually, he ended up actually killing his father. Yep. Yeah. Ended, ended, up, ended up regicide. Regicide and patricide, same thing. Committing these two crimes that will go to Abhiji hell. But because Buddha is there, he managed to change it and become a Dharma protector. Of course, his father is going to a better place as well. And Buddha has the ability. So my point is that one little difference on a very great cultivators, right? Put in our world, he may be level of, you know, great cultivators like Master Ching Kong and all that. But that little bit of hatred, you know, will spark into flames that engulf him. And next life, he only think about vengeance. And the best way to vengeance on someone who did wrong to you is become his son. You can see in many life, all right? Um, many stories like why is this son this guy is so good doing so well so many properties and you know rich and then his son came out or his daughter came out spent it all wasted it all right so back to the point um 
That's for Shariputra, the most notable story. What about Mogadalayana? Bu Jianlian. You guys might have heard of the story. Oh, I know a story about Bu Jianlian. Yeah. It's like, he, he, I think it's like Master Jing can say is he can spend one day, one night mm. and calculate all how many beings are still in our planet and in our system. Yes. Yes. He's the, scient he's the curious scientist in the Sangha, basically. How far can Buddha's boys travel? He did that. He's like, let's go all the way to eons and eons of Buddha's land, right? Pure land, all that. He went past there to a place where there is a Buddha called Sijian Zizai Wang Lulai. I don't know the uh, English. It says um, the free and uh, boundless uh, Buddha. Basically, his merit is uh, free and boundless. And he was in this Buddha's land where he's like trying to detect how far Shaiyamuni Buddha's voice travel. And then the, the, the Bodhisattva in the Sangha of this um, other world Buddha talked to the Buddha was like, what is this human head bugs resting on the shoulder of yeah. one of our compatriots? Ren Tou Chong. That's right. That. Yeah. He's like, why is this bug resting on Kenny's shoulders, basically? And then he's like, the Buddha was like, no, this is actually uh, number one, one of the top tens of the Buddhas of the Saha world, Shaimuni Buddhas. And then he talked to the, um, to the, to the, the, the bugs. It's like, um, please let go of your futile attempt, dear Venerable uh, 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 Mogadariana. Sorry, Mogadariana. Um, your attempt is futile. You cannot detect Buddha's uh, range. There's no range. He can reach anywhere. Bian Fa Jie, Xu Kong Jie, right? The, or the 10 Dharma realms. Because his heart is boundless, he's he able to do that. Basically, he's like, give up, man. Just go home. Listen, continue learning from the teacher. Version. Yeah, <laughs> my version. I would be doing a very rude one. Sorry. Um, but yeah. So, so that's how it is, right? He, he's trying to test like how, how much is uh, in the universe and all that. And he's trying to also save the Satya clan from being butchered, by massacred by the rivalry kingdom. And he's trying to bring 500 of them to the heaven. No, actually, there are two versions. One is to the heavenly realm. The other one is more human version outside the city. Out, to that's right. And it all became blood. Or blood water. It becomes basically a bag of blood. So Buddha was like, this is a karma. You cannot escape it. This is, um, you know, cause and effect. So everything about Buddhism always anchored down to that word, cause and effect, karma. So that's an interesting point about him. What's the other point? He has a lot of story we actually know. Have you guys heard of the Ghost Festival? Ghost Festival on the July, mid-July, where you, you know, offer, I don't know if you guys did that, offer, put out a brick, and then you just offer incense at the roadside. It's happened in Asia before. And then with some foods, buns, and then, yeah. So this was inspired by Ulamba festival. And Ulamba is a festival where um, originally is Mogadalayana. With all his miracle powers, he could not read his own mom's past life. What did my mom did wrong to cause her to go into hungry ghost realm? He can read other hungry ghosts, understand what happened past life, help them. He could not help his own mom because he was too shaken, looking at his own mom and suffering. He's trying to feed her and then all the food becomes fire. So he gets a bit shaken, even though he's enlightened. And then he just goes to Buddha. And then Buddha was like, because you are, you, because it's your mom, you can't think objectively. That's why you cannot see as is. So he's trying to help the, his students by showing his mom's um, past life, you know, being very jealous, being very angry, sh um, short-sighted, you know, those kind of bad habits. And it's like, what can I help? What can I do to help my mom out of this predicament? So he's like, actually, we have, because in India, um, they have this period of season where they should stay in indoors to avoid harming the animals. So basically, it's like a summer. I was thinking India does not have four seasons, right? Maybe in, I don't know. Basically, it's monsoon season where rains was pouring and all that, and they were trying to 
keep the monks indoor so that they don't harm the beings as little as they can. So they have this place where they sit down, thousands of them, you know, have their little, um, it's like a temple basically. And then Buddha is there giving re-education in a sense, like a seminar, right? Uh, so they're trying to, trying to um, gather together with that. Then they have that tradition until today. If you see the Theravadan countries, there's a lot of that. So back to the point, what he did is offer on behalf of your mother to every single monk in this community. They are all practiced, cultivated, most of them enlightened. So use these merits, dedicate to your mother, and your mother will get the benefit from it. And with that benefit, his mother goes straight to the Tao Li Tian, which is the second level of desire realm. So that's the story. And that story leads to this practice nowadays, trying to um, help your deceased parents, the deceased family. All right, so Mogadalayana has a also very important point. Uh, he was beaten to death by, actually he was, he, he died by the falling rocks, pushed by the um, other religious. religious people, you know, because of jealousy. Why? Because he can use miracles to um, take, how to say, to, to show the point you know, of cause and effect. All he used the miracle for, it's not for money, is to show cause and effect. Like your past life, your past life, why you have this situation, show you your past life. And you understand, I need to solve the problem with my family, with my colleagues and my king and stuff like that. So everyone was jealous of him because they cannot touch Buddha. They understand that Buddha has all the merits. Even his own cousins cannot kill him, Devadatta let alone these people. So he's trying to do that to his student, his beloved student. So he did that to Mogadalayana. Do you guys think Mogadalayana, with all his power to travel the universe and everywhere, not just the country, could escape these falling rocks? Could he escape it? He could, right? Yeah. Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he escape his own fate that he could avoid? Like, if you know, in 10 minutes from now, when you walk out of that door, right, that table is going to hurt your toes. Are you going to avoid it? Oh, it's very, yeah, different in scale. But anyway, you will avoid it, right? But he didn't. He didn't. He allowed himself to be crushed to death in the most painful sure. way. Because he knows his past life. Buddha actually explained to them afterwards, right? So... Because he know in the past life he was a fisherman, fishmongers. And guess what fishmonger did? Thousands of life in his net. And one by one, gill. And put it on the fish market. So he did that. So he understand, this is debt I need to pay. And it's a very small debt because he is Arahant, at the very least. And Arahant does not rely on, doesn't need the body. He can go back into the spiritual level, intact, not losing his memory. So he, he can do that as a very small price to pay for, for a very serious, not serious, for, for, a, for quite serious crime, I mean, serious killing, karma. So he did that. And of course the king was angry that his beloved teacher's student died. So he pushed all these heretics into the pit of fire. So they all get their own karma as well. Having said that, uh, I hope this story from Mogadayana tells us that no matter how powerful you are, you know, you can fly all the way to, you know, the Alpha Century, another Milky Way, um, another civilization. It does not matter. Karma is karma. You know, you can bring your whole family all the way there. If you have a karma, even sitting here, nothing happened, you will fall onto you, right? Chinese they're saying that you sit down you sit you sit calmly in your home, the disease will still be for you, like you know, falling lamb or something on top of your head. And people will say it's by chance. It's not. Nothing in this world is coincidence. Everything has cause and effect, you know, going on. And this is a very complicated cause and effect. Everything was mashed together and it would take its own course. So my our job is not to think about it, because we can't with the power of 
Mogadirayana, he couldn't even figure it out entirely. The only way we can do is understand how do we improve our moral standing, our merits. So now to the main topic, Mahakashyapa. Mahakashyapa, I need a book. Mahakashyapa is number one in ascetics, asceticism. So he's very good in perform, uh, doing the ascetic total thing. There's a Chinese um, monk Sangha, uh, which, I, which touched me a lot. They're trying to restore the original face of Buddhism. You know, because now we have the house, we have a beautiful temple, sometimes laden with gold and all that. And if people didn't practice properly, it becomes a place for, you know, business, selling beads and all that, rather than like what Master Ching Kong trying to prove the point, um, giving the Dharma talk, helping people. So Mahakashyapa was born under the trees, just like Buddha. You alright, Jenny? Uh, Judy? You good? Okay. No worries. So, he's born under the trees, yeah. The guy, I think he's the one to lend, uh, lend the dress or the clothes to the future Buddha. Okay, that's the uh, end of the story. Why do you spoil me? That's okay. <laughs> that's good. That's him. Yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> so, okay, he, he was born under the tree just like Buddha. He's very similar to Buddha. People say if Buddha has 32 qualities, he has 30 qualities. Almost very close to Buddha. And same thing, eight years old, he learned everything, right? Poetry, painting, arithmetic, uh, everything in the world. And he's the only son, of course, only children in the family. You know, the parents was like, you have to marry, you know, to continue our line. And then, um, and he's like, no, I want to be uh, living a spiritual life. I don't want to be married. Uh, I have no strong desire to five, five desires. Um, but his parents was like, no, you have to marry. So I think this topic is quite close to home to some of us. Um, the parents was like, okay, Tell me, uh, no, the, um, the venerable uh, Kashyapa, he's like, all right, if you want me to marry, do this. So he commissioned a famous sculpture to sculpt a beautiful uh, pic uh, sculpture of a beautiful lady. Uh, this golden sculpture of a beautiful lady, he pointed to the parents and uh, pointed to the sculpture and say, mom and dad, find someone as beautiful as this sculpture and then I'll think about marrying her. I'll think about marriage. Of course, they were like, they, they know he's trying to make it hard for, for their parents to find someone like that. You know, maybe basically anime-looking, anime very good-looking uh, pictures. So what they have is they went all around because they are powerful, rich people and they have connections. They went all around the cities. They couldn't find it. So they have a tactics. They leave the golden statue in the middle of the town hall and ask everyone, everyone, if you want to be pretty, you want, if you want to look pretty, if you want to, you know, get a very good looking uh, face, just go toss some coin and pray to them, you know, pray to the statutes. So everyone do that because, you know, everyone wants to be pretty. And they didn't find anyone. So they went all the way to the rest of the Indian peninsula, right? Trying to find it in neighboring kingdoms. So they found it. And when his actual wife happens, Subrat, Subrat, Subhadra Miao Xian Buddha. I think anyway. Subhad Subhadra, the name of the lady, when she appears, it was said that I know it's not exaggeration, I'm pretty sure it's real. The glow of a beauty has overshadowed the statute. So the statute kind of melt in the face of her beauty. <laughs> well, it's like, oh yeah, I know, I know it's hard to <laughs> What a way to say it, right? Uh, you know, the glow of the beauty has melted even the most beautiful and eloquent statue made in the world. So they found it. Of course, talked to the father of the, the lady and it's like, of course, you are one of the richest people, basically like, you know, Elon Musk or something. So basically you were the richest um, family in the city, Kashyapa's parents. So Fu died basically. So what happened is um, they married. But 
when on the day of their marriage, where they're supposed to consummate it, and the wife was like, very sad. She's sitting there. Maka Shepa is also very sad. So he realized that his wife is also not happy. So he's looking at her and say, what's going on? He's like, I, I, before you know, I got married to you by arranged marriage, I actually looking forward to a spiritual life. I want to be a monk, a nun. And he's like, yeah, me too. <laughs> so they got married because of the same goal as well. Sorry? Cause and effect, guys. Cause and effect. If you don't have the same goal, you won't get together. So they have the same goal, except this goal is not to be having children or consummate the marriage. So they did not consummate the marriage at all for 12 years. So first, they split. You know, they have two beds in the room. All right? So they sleep left and right. But mom and dad found out. You know, Mark Kashyapa's mom and dad found out. It's like, no, you're married. You're supposed to sleep in one bed and have kids. So they removed another bed, forcing them with one bed. Of course, being very wise and smart, what do you do? We take turns, right? Take turns to sleep on the floor. So they've been taking turns and say, be patient. Our chance will come, all right? That chance is 12 years. 12 years of this kind of life. But they actually are very well-cultivated people. So they don't have the desires as strong as I might say, I might dare say a lot of us feel. So, right, they have very light desires. So they were like they were like that for 12 years and until the passing of Mahakashyapa's parents, they were like, it's time. I need to go out. Because they dare not, he dare not to defy his mom and dad. His mom and dad really, really cherished this baby son of theirs. So it will crush their heart. So he's keeping quiet until his parents passed for 12 years. And uh, after 12 years, He's like, all right, Subhata, I'm going out. I'm going out to find the best teacher that is in the world so that I can gain enlightenment. And when I did, I will find you. I will, I will introduce my teacher to you so that you may gain enlightenment as well. See? It's love as well, man. It's a different kind of love. It's called Fa Jun, like Dharma love. So what he did is he went out. He went out into the um, town a Buddha was actually back in Venuvana, bamboo groves. So he's living very close to where Buddha found his enlightenment. So Venuvana, Buddha was... Um, so actually Buddha back then was still learning to find enlightenment. Holy moly, think about that. Buddha was actually not achieving enlightenment at that time. He heard of his his presence already. So he's trying to get close to him. If this is not a good teacher, I'm not going to, you know, stay under him. So when Buddha was giving the sermon, uh, after gaining enlightenment, um, he was in Venuvana, bamboo groove, Lu, uh, Zuling Jingse. And in the bamboo of Venuvana, where the Mahakashyapa was, it was quite a few kilometers away. It was outside. So he heard of him, he's trying to meet him. But before he went to the Venuvana, Buddha already sitting next to the tree that he just passed by. He's like, basically he did that. Why are you there but the here? So he, first thing, he already showed that he has this ability. Second thing is his eloquence, the way he carried himself, convince him this is the teacher he needs to follow. So he become his disciple. So when the Buddha uh, met Mahakashyapa, he talked to Mahakashyapa. Only a person with full enlightenment deserves to be a teacher. So this is how highly he praised the merits of Mahakashyapa. Because Mahakashyapa himself can easily become one of the founders or anything. But he was like, only person with 100% enlightenment, right? Flawless conduct can be your teacher. That means it's, this is how high he is. So, and then he, Mahakashyapa, become his students. And seven days after he become his students, he gained enlightenment. Seven days. <laughs> How many lifetimes have you been born and trying to get there, right? Seven days. Oh, God. But look at his past life, though. Then you understand, oh, okay, actually, he'd been through a lot. He, he went through a lot of um, places. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, what else? Mahakashyapa is a very quiet man. He's not talk. He don't talk a lot. 
He's unlike Ananda. Ananda talks a lot because Ananda asks a lot of questions, remembers a lot, leads with a lot of people. He likes to learn a lot of different things. Mm, Venerable Kashyapa, uh, Maha is a praise to him, big, great. But Kashyapa is an actual name. Venerable Kashyapa is very quiet, solitude, likes to stay by himself, uh, does not do social things. But uh, when he become enlightened seven days after, it was said that the moment he ordained as a monk is the day that Buddha gained enlightenment. Yet another coincidence, not really. The day he was born under the tree is the same tree as the Buddha was born. So both of them born under the trees. The day Buddha gained enlightenment is the day he became a monk. And then seven days after he became a monk, he gained enlightenment. So with that out of the way, his story continues. He has a lot of story about him. So Venerable Mahakashapa has a very touching stuff. Even though he don't talk, he's very silent. He's not expressive. He went by a very poor lady, right? That's where your um, point of, you know, he only asked alms from the poor people. He went by the poor elderly lady who can't even stand straight. She was um, a lot of ulcers on her body. And she begging for food from the households. And she only got uh, doesn't even have a bowl. She only have a clay, a piece of clay that's a little bit curved. And she only managed to receive the rice water, the water that you use to wash the rice, right? She only used that to carry a little bit of rice, not even rice, the husk of the rice and the water with it. So not even a proper meal. So with that, she went back to her places. Also, she doesn't even... She can't even find a piece of clothing, a proper clothing. She only used the three leaves weaved together to cover herself. Literally like a primordial person, which is very sad. And she sat down there and, you know, trying to get through this painful existence. So Venerable Kashyapa passed by and looked at her and it's like, it must be past life. She's not giving. She must be not giving to lead her to this condition. We need to help her, right? Remember, his mindset is not, ah, your past life. Okay, yeah, bye. He's like, let's try to help her. And he, as an enlightened monk, the help is multiplied if she's willing to offer what she has. So he went by to her and say, uh, elderly lady, could you please offer me your, um, the, you know, rice water in your hand, in the clay? And the lady's like, oh, dear venerated monk, you are, so respected and so, you know, revered. How can I give you this dirty water, drinks? And then, you know, um, Kashyapa was like, no, uh, no, no, no. He's like, it's okay. If you offer to me, your condition will improve. He's just asking her, just give it to me into the arm bowls. So he received everything from that clay water into his arm bowls. In front of her, he drank every single drop of the water without a flinch of disgust or anything. He just drink it and eat every single bit, pieces. And the lady was delighted, very joyful. Not long after, she passed away, escaping this painful existence, and she went into the heavenly realm. I think Dao Li Tian. Right, Dao Li Tian? I think... Just talk about Dao Li Tian one day. I think for us, it's like if we have food, come back to some look back on food, like if that kind of food, we must do disgust, I'm not sure. Yeah. Why he can manage to stomach this kind of, you know, leftover rice. And then apparently his ulcer also oozes stuff that drops into the rice bowl as well. Because she, she's already in that miserable existence, right? She doesn't have time to keep his, herself clean and all that. And all the disease coming out, dropping into the water. I think it's that, that one is the story of Buddha. Buddha himself, except this kind of alms. Um, Ma, Ma, Venerable Mahakashyapa just accept the leftover food. Just one another Venerable only goes for the rich or Next time, I forgot. So anyway, so Venerable Mahakashyapa um, take that and help the lady to go to heaven. So, you know, a monk can do so much things. That's why monk is precious in, in a community because if they truly cultivate accordingly, even though they're not enlightened, right, there are merits warrants that kind of respect. And if you help them to propagate it, 
of course you will grow your own merits and this is how it should be this is how it works and um, this is what Buddha is trying to seek you know the merits of all beings you know the greater benefits of all beings this is how we actually benefit the sentient beings if you say past life next life what about this life I mean you know if your meritorial strength is powerful enough you'll be able to do it and get the reward in this life but if you only seek rewards and not trying to cultivate more by giving out, then you're only restricted to what you have. So that's up to you, right? They only give you conditions. The cause and the effect is your own business. There is a story of yeah. one, of, uh, one, one of Master Ching Hu, mm. um, teach, uh, when he started his career, he's quite poor in the mm. beginning. He didn't have much savings. Yeah. Um, and his teacher asked him to give, mm. and he said, I don't have anything to give, I earn this much money and I spend it, I don't have any saving. And the teacher said, do you have one dollar? And he said, oh, one dollar should be fine, I should have it. And then he started donating from the one dollar, and just a small amount, whatever he has. You know? mm. um, so it's similar to the story, you give whatever they have, just give. Just give it. Yeah. Just, keep, really just like the old lady, right? Yeah. Keep giving. Yeah, her only food, she give it away. No yeah. matter how much or the quality of the giving, mm. that's all they have and just give. It's the heart, it's from the heart, it's not the material itself. That's right. And also there's another story in um, ancient China, I think. There's a very poor, la poor lady. She went to the temple where the abbot uh, was there and then she only has two dollars on her body, on, on herself, on a wallet. But she gave that two dollar away because without that two the two dollars is the only thing she has in the whole world. She gave the two dollars away. The abbot himself, this big temple, came out and preside over the ceremony of dedicating merit to her. So later, because of this merit, in the same life, she became the concubine in the imperial um, court. Back then, become a concubine is a huge thing for a woman. It's very hard for a woman to advance anything else if you want to get to that level, unless you're born to a wealthy family. So she became that, she has thousands of goals and she carried that to Huan Yuan in the same, to say thank you to the temple. So he donated thousands of goals to the temple. But that time, the abbot does not come up. The abbot called his students to come up and the student presides over his uh, ceremony of thanking. It's like, when I was poor, the abbot himself came out for two dollars. Now if I'm, now I'm rich, I have thousands of dollars. I'm donating thousands of it, but you call your student to come out. What, what do you mean? Right? What is this? It's like back then, your heart is 100%. Your heart is really, really, you know, yearning and very earnest in your giving. Now, because you have power, your position, you have status, more or less you feel a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm better, you know, a bit arrogance. Uh, that is to be expected. And, and hence your heart is about 50%. So, so I'm just going to give you half of me, which is my students. <laughs> a student with half of my um, merits to you. It's just an education method, of course. I mean, I but happy to do that. But she's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. That's why. It's not about the dollars. All right. It's all about the heart. So, thank you. Um, and then three years after, he talk to his wife. It's like, okay, his previous, not wife, his um, fellow practitioners. So he talked to his uh, Subhata and say, I found a teacher, I gained enlightenment. And then, why three years? Because that was a time when Buddha's Yima, is it Yima? Buddha's uh, foster mother, you know, his own mother yeah. passed away straight away after giving birth, going to the heaven. And the sister of her mother, which is her aunt, his aunt, take care of her and also marry into the family. So his foster mother, which is his aunt, begging Buddha to be to accept a woman into the Sangha. Back then it was not easy, right? And of course, after a few deliberations, woman finally entered the Sangha, former uh, nun. Uh, so you have monk and nun, Bhiksu, Bhiksuni. So Bhiksuni just formed at that time. So Venerable Mogadalayana, um, sorry, Venerable Kashyapa found the right opportunity 
to invite his um, wife. previous wife to sounds wrong his wife fine his wife into the sangha and say this is the op perfect opportunity come and learn from the buddha so i think she gained enlightenment but of course not seven days but not long after and she was well known for her ability to read past life and i actually just read from wikipedia a lot of story about subhatra a lot of in her past life immediate past life all the way back to the previous buddha uh Jasa for you know um, Kashyapa Buddha, not Maha Kashyapa, Kashyapa Buddha. He has been with Kashyap, the, the Kashyapa, or the, the main character of the story, for many last past life. Like they've been husband and wife, they've been daughter, they've been, they've been siblings, all this relationship, they've been everywhere. And Buddha was there as well, Ananda was there as well. Read up in Wikipedia, they say, um, so Subhatra was like part of the family in the past life with Buddha, Shaimuni with Ananda. So you can re understand everyone here has relationship in past life. You know, that's why we gather here. Like right? cultivations, families, in your own circle as well. So those things continues. All right? And even in Buddhism, when you get enlightenment, we call it the perfect ending. Right? Right before um, Kashyapa and Subhuti uh, born into this world, our current you know, 2,500 years ago world, they were in Brahmin heaven, right? They were enjoying the fun tian. They were actually in, their past life was in heaven. And then when time is right, they came down to this earth and go through their last journey together. And so Mahakashyapa went to the last line and then his wife or companion came after, three years after. So just, just to inspire us, right? We have different timeline but you know the fact that you have people in your life just cherish that relationship and if you can bring it to a perfect conclusion if you, as soon as possible as close as possible um, because what is perfect conclusion perfect conclusion is the one that you no longer have to suffer separation suffer pain suffer death um, afterwards and in buddhism buddhism offers this right because in other 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 mindset you might be able to go go to heaven to the top ceiling of the heaven but you still fall back you still separate but in pure land in nirvana no matter what method you get you get to nirvana you won't be separate anymore because in a sense you are back to your buddha nature yeah i think in master jing they always specify that we should go to western pure land that's right that's right Nirvana is Western Pure Land. Pure Land is with Nirvana. In, in the general communities, people don't understand Pure Land. They will say Nirvana. But, but for us, it's a very concrete thing. It's because, called Pure Land. Because in Western Pure Land, I'll say yeah. you have one more lifetime or something in Western Pure Land, then you'll become the Buddha or something. Yeah. You know why? Because in one lifetime, there is no limit. So the so-called one lifetime can go through eons and eons if you want. You can just stay there and enjoy the sermon. You don't do anything, passive, passive income. This is like passive enlightenment. <laughs> you just sit there without, without, without doing anything. You just sit there and then you get enlightenment. You just, you just follow the schedule they have. You just become enlightened. So that's how amazing that place is. So that's one thing, right? And other people like to go different ways. They want to you know, go through the, but that's the different journey. Way, I mean. Yeah. For us, we focus on pure land. And that's why... Like I say, like, if we can carry people, especially those close to you, to this finish line, that's amazing. Because with all the love, with all the care, with all the worries, with all the pain and happiness you have with them, it's cherishable, but also it's not going to last. You might forget about them next one. Uh, do what you can in this life. All these venerable, even though they are Hmong, they still, you know, feel it to their mother. They still, you know, being honored, honorable to their wife and you know to their own family um and of course they have their aspirations they might leave home temporarily like buddha did to his wife but he also go back and his wife become one of the nuns so he did not abandon his wife remember that he understand that there's no a better way to deal with this relationship you know, rather than going down the worldly realm which how many good ending do you see in the worldly one not saying that we shouldn't but understand that and understand 
how Buddha, Mahakasyapa, and many other monks lead their close one to enlightenment. All right? For us, we can also direct it in pure land. Your family, your, your loved ones, your you know, work friend as well, even. I think you talk to your work friend about Buddhism as well. Right? You share the story of Master Ching Kong mm. to them and they loved his voice. So that's how you enlighten them. I think yeah. most of the energy, a lot of people that in the past life already stay ready. Oh yeah, when you go up there, oh you are do you are doing this and that and that in the past. I knew you from that part and part. Oh yeah, we actually sit here together in the past. Something like that. That's a lot of story to tell, man. I love it. I love Buddha story. Um but I I'm, I have to push push ahead. Uh found Buddha in touch by the, okay, I did that. Three years after find his wife. Yep, yep. Arms from the poor lady. Yep, yep. It's very smart. So every top top the top tens, every one of them has their chief achievements. You know, like Guan Yin for compassion. Even the Bodhisattva disciples, you know, Manju Street for his wisdom, right? My Tritya for his compassion. He's he's always smiling, he's always compassionate. And and Di Zhang, you know, the City Garpa, very famous among us, is his huge vow until the hell is empty i will not become buddha that means he will always be there for every single being even though they're in avici hell the very moment he can come out he will try to pluck them out and put them to the bed better wheel it has to be up to them this is a huge job look at the eyeballs he has to sacrifice uh, the venerable uh sariputra had to sacrifice it's more than just two eyeballs for venerable for Siddhi Karpa. A lot. He has to sacrifice a lot. And since I'm at the topic of Siddhi Karpa, um, he's the caretaker of Buddhism from now, right now, until the Maria Buddha comes. Um, Dijang Bosa, Siddhi Karpa. Yeah. It's like Buddha actually literally just, 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 just say, um, Siddhi Karpa, um, when I, when I passed, you know, my hope of this the hope of these sentient beings dependent on you. Please, please help them. Even they have a little speckle of um, merits. So everyone cry when they read the Siddhikapa Sutra because it literally says Buddha before his passing, just back, literally just like the um, Siddhikapa, please, please help these sentient beings. Even they have one speckle of merit to be redeemed. Redeem them. Please redeem them. So Siddhikaba was like, I will. Because the virtue of Siddhikaba is a huge vow of emptying the sins of the world, which is almost impossible. And understanding that he continues. And so until Maireya Buddha comes and do the Longhua Sanhui, you know, the three times of Dhamma will, I don't know how to say it properly. Basically three times when Maireya Buddha comes. Dhamma gathering. There's three Dharma gatherings, the three Dharma um, Fahui, there's three um, Dharma assembly. Every one of them will get enlightenment, including all of you. Of course, now we have pure land. We don't have to wait for 56 billion years. How many lifetimes we have to deal with, with that? No, 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 don't do that, guys. Don't do that to yourself. Just go to pure land and then help my rare Buddha to help these three assemblies. That's a better way. Yeah, yes. Yeah. If we have that much lifetime, we might commit crimes and I can guarantee you, like, chances are, even the pious training people, when they got killed or hurt, they will have a little angers. And that would cost yeah. you the lower So look at how many angers we have and greed we have compared to that. And then we understand, hmm, okay. Must be the paradise. Yeah. All right. Um, back to Mahakasyapa. Venerable uh, Kasyapa has very, very, very strict. So I watched, back to that, I watched the temple. A uh, great documentary uh, where this monk trying to rejuvenate the practice of ascetism in the Chinese Buddhist community. Miao Jing Zhang Lao, something like that. So he's trying to, he started by doing ascetism himself, living in a Mao Chao Wu, living in a grass hut, right? A hut made of grasses. And then he just, of course, he has Hu Guan, uh, because the Chinese also been practicing this. We have 
people who protect the cultivator, you know, from being disturbed for months until he gained that uh, maybe enlightenment or certain level. Uh, I'm not too sure. What I can see is what he did and the influence he has, the positive influence he has in a Buddhist community that was quite splintered, to be honest. And so he, he, he did that, went out of his seclusion and go to the world and, you know, find a place because everyone already heard of him since 90s and they all support him, you know, like us, lay Buddhists support materials and logistics and the sanghas that want to be his monk follow him. And then he started doing the kind of like a three month journey of like a trekking. So everyone carries a big bag and go through China from north to south. And then went through the highway, went through the mountains, follow exactly the teaching of the Buddha to the letter. Of course, they didn't do that all the time because this is only once in a while. Well, they, they stopped doing that already. But this is enough to show you how it works, how a proper Sangha looks like when it functions. Install confidence for us. I was touched. And then they just went by. First thing, no touching of money. They're not supposed to touch money. So this is an exception, of course, but um, I will tell you why um, there is two major debates in our um, Buddhist community. It's not, it's not ultimatum, like this is, has to happen and that has to stop to exist. It's just a way to, to touch sentient beings, to reach out to sentient beings is different. This one is by example. I'm doing it right. I'm conducting myself 100% correctly as a model for you to follow. That's it. To inspire confidence, to inspire respect. So he did that. And, you know, he went through the, the China North and South, uh, begging alms, literally. So everyone, he went there, knock more than, no more than three times. Knock two times. So first time, no answer. Wait a bit. Knock second time, no answer. Next door. And then if they have seven doors, they can only knock seven doors per day. Exactly seven doors. And the seven doors, if no one's answering, they don't get anything. So they have to cultivate uh, and repent as well on their karma because they didn't practice merits. If you have merits, right, even though you don't go to work, you just sit there, the food will just come out. <laughs> like someone will just feed you or something. Or you're begging, right? If you have like billionaire kind of means, you know, if you have the kind of billionaire um, mindset, you, even you just sit there begging for money, just a new condition, you will get it. So basically they're reflecting. If I don't get anything from my alms session, that means I didn't cultivate merit. Oh, that's, yeah. that reminds me of Master Jane Collins. The start is that the more you give, the more you get in the end. That's right. Starting from his um, lay Buddhist, lay person path, when he was working, he started giving one, two dollars, and then this snowball into you know millions of dollars to help the um, foundation of the Han Institute in Malaysia, in Taiwan, in in China, in Taiwan, China, and England. Yeah. So this begging arms, right, is very strict. I'm just trying to tell you how strict it is. It's still being practiced not long ago, not some 2,500 years ago thing. So no more than seven times knocking the door and have to eat before the sun reaches the meat. So it can be 12, it can be 11.30. To be safe, 11.30. That's why in this temple, we start 11.30. Uh, 11 and stop eating around 11.30. I think so. To be safe. So, um, what else? They gather their food together to make sure the food distribution is equal. Also because of the story of the Buddha. They make sure the food distribution is equal um, by tossing everything into the big pot and then mashing it down, mixing it together and, and, and distribute it equally to every Sangha. So no one gets, so not, no one saying, that, oh, this one is more famous. This monk gets more gong yang, you know, get more offering so he can enjoy more. Everyone gets the same. So they have no discrimination. They have no um, trying to, you know, compare. They just sit there and eat. When they eat, they cannot look at the food too long. They cannot like, oh, what do I have? <laughs> uh, oh, fish. Uh, not fish. Um, carrots. 
But in Theravada, they eat meat, you know that, right? Thailand, Thailand. Thailand and all that, they accept offerings, meat or not meat. I went to one of the Theravada temple. So all I can eat is eggs and vegetables. But it's, it's normal. It's according to the Buddha's teaching. They don't enforce vegetarianism in Buddha's time. Remember though, Buddha has miracle ability. He can just conjure that meat and stuff. Generate. Yeah, but for us, we don't have that. So we actually have to kill something mm -hmm. to get that. However, it is what it is. So in China, we have Liang Wudi, you know, Emperor Liang that enforced vegetarianism and it spread out throughout any other traditions that was influenced by Chinese Buddhism. Back to the point. So you cannot look more than, I don't know, too long. You cannot just stare at the food and say, oh, I like, oh, this carrot is like well cooked, let's cook. No, you have to just think about, you know, what you learn, the sutra or like Amitofo, doesn't matter. Whatever you practice, they do not enforce one method. They enforce the method that talks to you. Of course, in that Sangha, they, they have their, you know, Leng Yen and all that. So the point is they recite mantra and just eat, 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 and then observe, repent, you know, this body is used to help me to attain enlightenment. It's, it's what happens, same thing as the Bhagwan Zai Jie, you know, the eight precepts. So they do the same thing and then they put down and then they meditate like what we did. And then when they sleep, they cannot stay in one place more than a night. So this tree, look, imagine like this huge site, you know, next to Sydney Harbour is beautiful. You cannot stay there for more than one night. Yes, you can enjoy for this night. Tomorrow you have to move. Do you guys know why? Why he has to move? That's right. You don't want to get attached to this beautiful location. So also they live, they sleep next to a cemetery as well at night. Um, a group of them, they sit maybe next to the cemetery area to observe where we end up, where our body end up. So they've been practicing this and number one person that promotes this a lot, more than Buddha, is Venerable Maha Kashyapa. He's the founder of this practice in Buddhism. Yes, it was there in India long before Buddhism founded, but he's the one that make it systematic. And with the Buddha's precepts, decree of it, the precepts, you know, what to do, what not to do, and the uh, thousands of rules that a big Su must follow, San Chen Wei, about 3,000 etiquette rules, a proper big Su must follow, uh, including how you sit, how you stand, how you walk, how you talk, every single movement is, is to be restricted, not by others, by yourself. If you don't, of course you don't get enlightenment. So, uh, he did that even at this ripe old age of six, 70, 80s. Can you imagine someone like Master Jin Kong just do that, sleeping outdoor on the grass and then just, you know, exposed to the element. Rain or not rain, he still have to do that. He can seek shelter, but natural stuff, you know, how much shelter can you get? Cave maybe, but he cannot stay more than one night. And Buddha was a bit worried about his um, beloved student. He's like, oh, I need to get him back. And then he just, you know, he just summoned him to the Lumbini garden. And then because Buddha was giving a sermon and Mahakashyapa was like, yeah, Buddha is around, my teacher's there, I should greet him. So he walked in, but because of that kind of lifestyle, you can imagine how long his beard was, uh, how long his hair was, and uh, how dirty his clothes is, you know, his, his, his rope. He's, he's not washing or anything. Lots of leaves, a lot of dirt. So when he walked in, he looks like a wild, random wild man, you know, like a primordial man, basically. So everyone were well shaven and clean. Look at this, this beardy well man. He was like, what is this? Shoo him out because you know, they don't want to disturb the sermon. And then Buddha did uh, something very, very straightforward. He's like, oh, Mahakashyapa, please sit next to me. Right? Mm -hmm. Imagine, right? Like Master Chikong sitting there. Oh, you come sit next to me. So Venerable Mahakashyapa is like, oh, no, it's fine. I'll just sit. So I'll just sit at the place I used to sit. But, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
No, she's like, uh, yeah, she praised Mahakashepa's merit, what he did to everyone. And then he talked to Mahakashepa, he's like, now that you, in your, you know, ripe old age, you should properly take a break from this. You know, we have Vihara for you. You can stay there, we'll take care of you. And then he's like, no, I need to continue doing this as an example to the rest of the world, to the, to the Sangha. Um, we need to, uh, I need to do this because um, it will reduce the desire, reduce the temptation. It will improve the um, standing of the Sangha in the world because of the um, integrity. Was This is how you, in you keep this Sangha true to the roots, not getting swayed by the offerings and all the honors and all the stuff. He, he's trying to keep it very grounded, right? So that everyone remembers what's the whole point of doing this, you know, not just to get praise from one of the powerful people in the world, is to gain enlightenment, is to show that uh, the worldly path cannot lead to a good ending or it cannot lead to a well-rounded ending. You're going to get stuck here forever. That's why he do that. And Buddha was, Buddha stopped pursuing that, of course, because that is his vow, his mission. So it's like, yeah, it's okay. So everyone was very respected to her, to him. And also another story, I think you guys have heard Zen Buddhism, the flower picking. One of the, one of the sermon Buddha was sitting there, not moving. Everyone was waiting for him to speak. And then for a very long, maybe one hour, half an hour, no one's like there to ask him, the Buddha because Buddha was really quiet and serene. And then suddenly Buddha just pick a flower. Can you imagine you sitting there waiting for master to talk? And then the master was like really serene, not moving for half an hour, one hour for a long time. I don't know the time. And then you guys were like, we were like waiting, waiting, waiting. Suddenly the master picked up a flower. Everyone was like, huh? huh? And then only one person smiled. Like literally like, like a, like a, you know, you get a gift kind of smile. That's Mahakashapa. For a man like him who's quiet, who's very strict, to smile, it takes a lot. And he smiled. And then Buddha was like, I have um, Dharma eyes. My Dharma eyes has been passed down to Mahakashapa. Mahakashapa shall be, Mahakashapa has seen what I see, has feel what I feel, has reached what I reach. Mahakashapa word is my word. Indirectly his successor. So everyone was like, yeah. And then he's the number two. Of course, Buddha is number one in Zen Buddhism. He started that. And then he passed down to Mahakashapa. And then of course, a lot of succession and then Bodhidharma, have you guys heard Bodhidharma? Zen, Buddhism, number one in China. Dharma Zhu Si. You guys watch a lot of the movies, right, in Hong Kong. Xiang Gang, Dharma Zhu Si, fly around and all that. And yes, he know Kung Fu. Guess what? Shaolin Kung Fu came from him. Yeah? yeah. Shaolin Kung Fu. You did, right? Yeah. 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 Hmm. Did you talk about Bodhidharma? Yes, yeah. Oh, wait, I remember. Oh, see? Cause and effect, man. <laughs> Condition. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So you guys have practiced Shaolin Kung Fu, right? Yeah, there's like classes mm. at like 7 p.m. Awesome. Yeah. Do you guys talk about Bodhidharma? Yeah, and we got dinner there for you as well. And after you practice Kung Fu, there That's right. And he's um, doing that because he's trying to make sure the monk has ability to defend themselves. Back then was crazy, you know, wars and all that. I think it's war and, and, and animals. They're trying to make sure they can defend themselves. It's just the condition. See how Bodhisattva adjusts their method according to the needs of the people under his care. So back to the point, because we're already reaching the Manchi Manchi time. Um, Manchi Manchi time, yeah. five years old. When uh, the power of Nirvana of Lord Buddha, right? When uh, Tathagata, the Buddha, sorry, I used Tathagata, Sijun. When Tathagata, when the Buddha has um, entered Parinirvana, right? He's, you guys saw the picture, right? He lie on the trees between the two big trees and they put him into a, to a, into a container, 
coffin, so to speak, trying to cremate the Buddha. But the oil does not lead, no matter how many tempt they have. It does not lead. So what happened? Mahakasyapa heard his own teacher is dying. Of course, he's very sad. And he went straight from where he was. It takes seven days. So when he reached to the Buddha's uh, remains, Buddha's leg extended out of the coffin. And then he, you, you saw Buddha's leg's picture before, right? There's a Dharma wheel underneath. There's the print of the Buddha back in Bovkaya. I think there's like a lot of pictures in his like legs. And it's amazing. And only for Mahakashapa, he reached out his leg. And then Mahakashapa kneeled down and said, I will continue to tread on your path. Um, go with peace, uh, teacher. So he retracted his leg without needing help from other oil lamp or anything. He just burned himself. That's a wrong way to say it. He just cremated himself with his um, samadhi fire. It happened in real life in China recently. In early 1900s, there was actually in Hong Kong, Ba Bai Shan, and there was a great monk in Hong Kong. Um, I think he, yeah, no, I think another person. He cremated himself with all the, not that protest cremation, it's literally like cremated without oil or anything. He just, his time is up and then he's like, stop breathing and then the cremation happens. And everyone was there, the reporter and everything. That was back in early 1900s. He passed away first. What's the name of? I forgot. He passed away first and then People say, oh, just wait, like we wanted to report this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back that days, you know, uh, the communications is, is slow and then the letters. Case, yeah, letters. Yeah, letters. And then he waited for three days. Mm. He's already passed away, but he's still there. Like, waited for three days. Yeah. So it's all recorded. People taking photos and then he just. Yeah. Cremate himself. Like, by himself. Yeah. So Buddha did the same thing. He cremated himself when his uh, beloved student has come and said, I will pass down your legacy. I will pass down your teaching. So. Remember, he is number one in holding the tradition. So now, when it comes to Sutra, remember Buddha don't, we don't, back then it's orally, like you, you, you spread it like this, you talk like this, you don't write down or anything. Only when he passed, after a few months, all the other huts, 500 were then was gathered, number one, Congregation, the first congregation of the Buddhist council. Ananda. It's in there, right? Ananda. Ananda. Yeah. But Ananda was blocked on the doorsteps. He was not allowed to enter by the decree of Mahakashyapa. Remember, they're all enlightened beings. No, they, no, no politics stuff like that. No, no, no. All they only think about is how to perfect the sutra. All right? So why Ananda was rejected? Anyone know why? This is not alive from here. Yes. Everyone's, ma everyone's other hand. He's not. He's only Sodapana or Anagami. He's almost there. He's like, I cannot let you in. You have not perfected your practice. So even though he's a key driver, you saw the Chutra, right? Ananda, Ananda. I was like, why can't Ananda come in? By that virtue, he should be. But remember, enlightened people has no fault of misperception. Hence, he needs to be fully enlightened to preserve the integrity of the sutra. So he was blocked on the door and Ananda was really, how to say, sad of his um, disqualification. So he immediately go back and practice. So we can understand Ananda is a little bit like, um, he loves to learn everything. You know, he goes everywhere, Buddha goes and say everything, see everything, learn all sorts of knowledge and stuff. But when it comes to real stuff, like serious stuff, and he's like, oh, I'm not qualified enough because I'm jack of all trade, master of none. So he's trying to push out like a procrastination, you know, last night before assignment. So he's trying to do that. <laughs> literally, Mahakashapa is like his teacher. He literally like trying to squeeze out the, his entire energy to push himself over the line to Arahant. He's like, if I don't be Arahant, everything I say and do will not be verified by 500 other hands, basically a stamp of approval. So he forced himself, and I think within seven days, he gained enlightenment. Because next to it, because there is a saying, because Buddha is his tanga, is his um, cousin, more or less he has a little bit like, yeah, it's my 
my cousin, man. He's cool. I mean, you know, he's going to help me to gain enlightenment. And, but you understand, right? You, only you can gain enlightenment. Buddha can only give you the path methods. Even like this, this is only the methods. If you don't really want to go there, Buddha, Shayamuni, and Buddha Amitabha can't force you. So Ananda has that mindset of reliance, dependence. He's like, oh, I just want to depend on my, you know, big brother, Shayamuni. Yeah, he's cool. And then when he passed, and then he's still not gaining enlightenment, and he's not qualified enough. Now he's, he's like, oh no, I got to have to get enlightenment. And that's what pushed him to that finish line. So everyone has different attitude, a different condition. Uh, so just need to find out the right condition and push yourself over to that finish line. Just hope that it's not a messy one where you have to deal with the aftermath and all that, you know. All right, uh, I'll stop here. Uh, we'll talk more on Subhuti and the um, first Buddhist congregation. I think it's important for us to know the story, uh, how our sutra came to be. Um, yeah, thank you. Amitofo. Before we go, because there are another 15 minutes before lunch, any questions? Any sharings, thoughts? Do you want to share that? Sure. No? Okay, fine. Anyone? No? You want to go? Let's go. Let's go. Oh, no? Nothing? How? Maitreya Buddha? No? Speaking of Maitreya Buddha, do you guys know? Oh, yeah. Mahakashyapa actually went into the mountain. Yeah, I forgot the part. Okay, to, 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 to wait for the future. Wait, I didn't forgot the part because I haven't finished the to congregation. Wait, to wait for the future, he opened the, the cave. Arkai. Yeah. He wait, split the cave into half and then he go in there and then it's close up. China, right? Yeah. And remember, Mahakashyapa passed down the Zen tradition, we call it Chan. Jana, Jana passed down the, you know, the Dharma eye, so to speak, to Ananda. So Ananda is number three. See? Yes, he might reject it in the doorstep when he really take it seriously and do serious work. Man, he flies, bro. He flies. He flies to the sky. Basically, these three, literally, Buddha, Shaemuni, um, and then uh, Venerable Mahakashyapa, and then Venerable Ananda, three of them is one to three of Chan. That's how it was started. And then Mahak Mahakashyapa has lived until like hundreds plus ages. And after the congregation, 500 Arahan, including, Ma uh, um, including uh, Ananda, has finished their first compilation of texts on the leaf, you know, Fan Beijing, in the, in the, what's Fan Beijing? Bei Yejing, in the, um, whatever leaf that is, I forgot. He went into a place called the Chicken Feet Mountain, Jitu San. Sounds very funny, but that is a replication, not the OG. The original is in India. Oh, so of, of course, he won't fly to China and then, but because China was um, not accepting Buddhism back then, it was still hard Zhou Dynasty. Yeah. 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 Is it? Yeah, it's but China Jesus are not it's India Jesus. Yeah. yeah. So it's like a, trying to remind us that this legacy continues. It's like a remember commemorating what Mahakashyapa did. So what he did actually in India is he went into this chicken feed mountain, sorry, <laughs> for lack of better type. Maybe the chicken has his feet there. Uh, anyway, I'll I'll try I'll, I'll find out why. Um that mountain is called Chicken Feet Mountain and he uh <laughs> And, uh, and, and there was a king, he was trying to say hi to the king, you know, because I'm going to stay here for a long time, you know, long after your kingdom is gone, but still saying hi to you because you're the host. And the king was sleeping, was napping. So he's like, ah, I don't want to disturb him. So he went into that mountain, half opened the mountain in half, went into the middle of it, a cave or something, and then he sat there and like, all right, I'll return with the Buddha's um, rope because Buddha passed the rope when he said, you have my Dharma eye. Now this is the first rope I'm passing to you. And he, Sanyi Iboma, there's three ropes of Buddha. One of them passed down to Ananda, 
which is on on on, on until China, on, on until the six part trip, Huilin, and then that's it. Stop. No longer passing. Um, the other one he keeps here, so that he can pass to Maitreya Buddha. It's like a symbolism of Dharma continuing. Close the cave, and almost went into eternal hibernation before Ananda and the king came up again with a very saddened heart and say, can I just say bye to you, um, teacher? In a sense, it's Ananda's teacher. And then they opened the, the cave and just to say goodbye. And then that's the last farewell in our, this, this generation. So the next time you see him, it's either as a assistant of Maitreya Buddha, if you go to Pyoland, where he will go to the Maitreya Buddha and pass down the, um, there's a nice animation on that by Aputi in, web, in YouTube. I love it. It touches me. And this little piece of, um, so I, this is the scale, right? This is Sayamuni Buddha's rope. This is the size of Maitreya Buddha back then. It will be one, how to say, small piece of cloth yeah, in his finger. And he took water to it. Yeah, and he it becomes large. huge. And he wear it himself. I think he wear it. I don't know. That's too much detail anyway. But the point is, Buddhism is all about passing down, you know, one by one. And Liu Zhu Huineng, the Venerable Master Huineng in China, back in Tang Dynasty, was spreading from one all the way from Shaim Buddha to him, and then he branched out and sprouted into the whole continent and the whole world, which is through Zen, Japan, same thing, in Korea, in Vietnam, and then Japan go to West and all that. So now it's like that. In Pure Land, uh, same thing, one by one, one by one, but Pure Land is never passing down like this. Pure Land is the tradition of, you know, as long as you're willing to go to Pure Land and you have the biggest contribution, everyone democratically voted the most co contributed person as the patriarch. So no one is like, like what, what's, what Pai musical, there's no like stream. It's just Ami Tofo and <sighs> go to Pure Land. I'll stop here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we'll end this by dedicating our merits and 10 times Amitofo. May the merits and virtue adorn the Buddha's pure land, repay the four kinds of kindness above, and relieve the sufferings of those in the three paths below. May those who see and hear of this aspire by uh, at the enlightenment and understanding of the world, then be born together in the land of ultimate bliss. Uh, me to for a 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 me to for thank you everyone